This is the Sustainable Goat Podcast. We look to nature for how we should interrelate to the world. All the answers are within nature if we take the time to listen. But what we have to find is a reasonable way how to handle plastic. You know, consumers expect more. They're expecting brands to be more sustainable. They're choosing sustainable brands. These are the stories and ideas from those that will define a generation. I'm your host, Steve Kassinem, and this is our planet in focus. My family is from near the lake, north of Milano. Rogiani is a very famous name in Italy that Armani, Rogiani, in north, the, you can recognize you are from north from the end of it, of the last name. But in any case, I born in the middle of Italy, in Umbria. It's the only place where the ocean doesn't touch. So Umbria is a very old, traditional, separated, uh, primitive place. So where the value, there's still value. And we did not get infiltrations. And I born in Terni, which means Interamna in Latin, city with two rivers. And in fact, in a Roman time, uh, they merge the two rivers and become a waterfall, 162 meters waterfall, the Cascata delle Marmore, that where you go there, just like 15 miles from my house, uh, you can see three rainbows. It's one of the most uh, different area you go, you can see three rainbows in the same time. Wow. Yeah, and that was... Uh, to bring water to Rome. This how important it was. Yes, because I mean, I remember growing up, you learn about Rome and you learn about how, you know, they were able to redirect water, use aqueducts yes. and, and manage the water. From us. Wow. From Terni, Interamna, sitting between two rivers. Wow. So you got to grow up just in that environment. And I remember we talked a little bit about your dad and just how, you know, even just using paper, recycling. What was life like growing up in a place like this that actually, you know, redirected rivers and kind of had that as history? This is a print and this is my notes. (laughs) This, you know, it never happened that anybody around me did not apply my father, recycle, protect the planet, love uh, the animals, save paper, save water. It's like, you know, when you're little, you don't understand very much. But then you see that everybody around you, they are doing the same thing. When I was uh, little, that's what the majority of the respect of the planet in Italy already started before then here. And in fact, uh, you know, my father told me all the time, you you cannot throw away a piece of of plant. This is a tree. The paper is a tree. You see this? This is a tree. You cannot kill that oxygen that we need. You write both sides of the paper and you breathe better. So he will just tell you why like that. Wow. That is such a cool way of actually looking at it. Is that the idea of the paper is the oxygen? And I don't think a lot of people make that. They go, oh, yes, it's a tree, but they don't think, oh, what's the other side of it? Yeah, you want to breathe better, don't, you know, use the paper twice. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and we we talked about recycling from just like this standpoint of how rigid it is in Italy, but also how much it's embedded in culture. And that part is really what intrigues me is just it's part of Italian culture. Well, actually, you feel natural to respect the rule and regulations uh, that you have to bring uh, your uh, plastic uh, in the collection place where the plastic is. Uh, You have to bring uh, your glasses, your bottles of Pellegrino wine uh, in a separate bag, so you're going to put it in a separate uh, bin. And that bin has a small hole, so nobody can take them and uh, resell them. or damage, and also the instruction is to put it down slowly because otherwise you break them. And 
for the workers later when they and then the paper the clean paper the cardboard everything is clean has a different bean and also you have the option that they come and pick it up uh, from your house uh, and you leave your bean outside so it's being taken a different day different tracks mm. you know well and Is there something to that, having it in different days, different trucks, or even making it where you have to travel with your recycling? Does it change that mindset of how you purchase things? Well, you do both. It depends. If it's winter and you don't, it's cold over there. You know, there is snow, there is a lot of rain. And so sometimes you cannot do that to bring it there. You know, it depends. There are people, they sign up to pick it up and people, they say, no, you know, when... I went uh, very often in my mother house. When I was there, I take it, you know, to the place. It's an experience. It's like a, a religion kind of uh, religious. You put uh, this in here, this is here, this is here. And it's a pleasure. You feel satisfied, you know? Yeah. I think there's something to giving a positive experience to someone who's, you know, this is like a habitual thing that you can you know, start to do at a young age. And so it kind of gives people that almost positive reinforcement of like, hey, this is not super complicated for one, but two, it's also just the way we do things. And it's a positive way of doing things. It's actually become a normal way of life. Like, uh, for example, you don't use uh, from the bottle of the detergent for the dishwasher, the dish detergent, you don't use as it is. You take an old bottle, you pour half and half. From one, you make two. Because more detergent you use, more water you need to clean the dishes. You don't need that much detergent. Yeah, yeah. It- And it's bad for you also because, you know, if you don't clean it very well, the dish uh, detergent, then you get poison, you know? Yeah. So I regularly do it all the time. Here I have two, two, you know, one is for something, one is for something else, the liquid. And then there is a super liquid that I use outside the house to put it on the cement and clean my shoes every time I come in. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, no. I never come in the house. And nobody can come in the house uh, if they don't wash their undershoes before to come in. I'm not asking you to take the shoes off, but at least to clean under. Yeah. I mean, it's it's <laughs> where you walk all day, every day, you know? You kind of want that space to be clean. It's yucky. So, you really... <laughs> I... I don't want it. <laughs> well, and we were introduced to each other because you have a certain expertise around fashion and clothing design and a specifically very, very deep knowledge around fabrics. Where did that kind of introduction to fabric come from? I mean, Italy's known for fabrics. So was that where it kind of the first introduction? Yeah, well, actually, in my case, is uh, I born like this. I born a designer because at five years old, I was already sewing in the little machines uh, and I broke my one machine a week, uh, but I started sewing and designing at four. At 10, I was publishing my first fashion magazine at the school and my father was helping me to put it together with the cardboard of the stockings of my mom. And so, and I was doing the drawing, I was doing the fashion directions. I was telling everybody, oh no, that's the wrong color for you. You should wear a flare skirt. This is a red is better for you instead of a blue. I was in the case of everybody all the time. I say, no, 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 this is better for you. So I was a fashion consultant already. <laughs> Well, and at 10, I mean, was that just exposure from your dad? Was that, I mean, that's a very unique story to actually be doing that at 10 years old. I mean, what were you fascinated with making at that age? What was the main article of clothing that you were making kind of at 10? Because that's amazing. Yeah, well, I was making skirts because it's very easy, you know, and I was making little dresses and I was also using 
any scraps uh, actually because see at 11 I went to learn from the tailor around the corner my mother tailor and I was an apprentice so whatever she was cutting I was collecting fabric that she didn't need it and then I start making clothes for Besides from dolls, uh, from dolls uh, become to me, from me to other people. And then the story continues in my life uh, that I have to dress everybody. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so you kind of come from this background of being surrounded by the idea of fashion. What was the fashion industry kind of like when you first started actually working in the industry? Because I think fashion has evolved so much over the years and it changes all the time. Yes, uh, it changes all the time. Uh, that's why maybe we can get to that uh, in a moment because I'm not doing fashion right now. My job is to do timeless products. That's why I'm here in this planet because fashion is fast and my product lasts. But in any case, going back uh, to Italy, the most beautiful place in the world, <laughs> <laughs> I had to go to study to become a doctor too because my father was a doctor and so I had to follow the step but his field was different than mine. I chose psychology but in the meantime I also I had different experience in fashion. Number one I was a fitting model with Luisa Spagnoli and I learned a lot about clothing over there in Perugia I was uh, and I did a comedy of art over there, painting and all different fine art because I was a really good painter. My father hired, actually, when I was 14, a friend of him that he was a painter to teach me oil. So I had already the oil experience, a combination of colors, idea of the environment. It was be outside. We had kitchen chickens that I grew up with the chicken on my lap uh, because she followed asleep on my lap. <laughs> yeah, just like, and she would do an egg, uh, you know, around the corner because, you know. <laughs> and then I grew up with the pigeons that come in in my bedroom and my mother yelling at them and birds in my bedroom. I grew up with animals because actually that's what's my passion is also plant and animals, you know. I think that I did uh, very different at 20 years old. I uh, opened my first store called Old America. It was based on the recycle, okay? And my belief was uh, that you cannot throw away anything. You can reinvent it and re and wear again in a different perspective. So I went to take the license to open a store when I was in college and with an older woman that she was like 15 years older than me, we become partner, but I brought, uh, you know, the fresh idea of whatever is the new world, the new way to see and help the planet. So we buy for 600 lira, uh, not euro yet. <laughs> Down south of Naples, uh, there, there were coming uh, possibility to buy this big, huge uh, sacks of used clothes from America. That's why it was called Old America. And from the boat, they come from America. Then we wash every single one. We divide them, uh, dresses, sweaters. And, and then so usually in our boutique, uh, there was like from a dress uh, from the 40s, uh, I will cut off the top part and use just a skirt and then take a sweater that had holes and whatever. And then cut with the rest of the dress, I will make like a flower or a heart and place it where the damage of the sweater and then sell it as a set, but separate like that, a skirt with a sweater that there will be a, a beautiful, pretty set, a little Chanel kind of reinvention, you know, like for college students uh, at that time. It was a really beautiful work of what we did, uh, not only in, but also shoes, hats. Uh, we had all kind of accessory that we recycled. So, wow. old America. <laughs> 
That's so cool. And also kind of unfortunate on one side because, I mean, it shows that there was so much waste available even when you started of just fashion pieces that weren't used anymore. And the fact that you were able to repurpose it, I mean, what has that kind of looked like as we've gone on through society from a waste perspective in fashion? I mean, what does waste look like in fashion? I mean, I know people are pretty well aware of that, you know, fast fashion, there's a lot of waste, there's water, stuff like that. But what about the other side where maybe people don't see that there's actually a lot more waste than people think? Yeah, there is a lot of more waste and body and it's in purpose. You know, the whole thing is a business that uh, I am this rebellious side because I do things in my way that not necessarily bring you possibility to buy what you, a house or nothing. It's a mission. My life is different because it's a mission. I'm sure my father, if he was still alive, he would approve my choice. My choice is, first of all, I believe if you really love the planet, you have to be an example how and what you do to save the planet. Don't just talk to other people. Have the other people see the way you do it. You don't wash your hair every day. That's wrong. I tell everybody, don't. Oh, but I can get out. I say, it's like drugs. You have to just wait one day and then you wash it every other day. And then you wash every three days and you will be fine. And then you wash every four and you will be fine. So little by little, you save the planet because you waste so much water washing your hair and all that soap. That is just a little help. All of us, if we do a little help, even don't wash your hair every day. But, you know, also it's unhealthy. (laughs) It's poison on your head. (laughs) So it doesn't matter if you support uh, the healthy product. It's still, you can wash it, uh, rinse it if you really need to. But you don't have to wash it every day. You know, myself, uh, I got lucky that time my father told me this also about the hair product and how you should not use the, the toothpaste every day. You know, you should use a bicarbonate of so. This morning I cleaned my teeth with the bicarbonate. Uh, so, so it become white. They look healthier. And you don't have to put that poison in there. And then uh, once a week, uh, I tell everybody, don't shower. So you can go six days and then you take a day off. Sunday is the no shower day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you save water. Well, and I know? think there's a lot to what you're saying around like that small action that a human can do on their own, even though they don't believe, hey, I'm making a really big impact by just doing this small thing. But when you collectively do it, that's when something major happens. There's a lot of people that live on this planet. Exactly. When you rinse the last time your glasses, I collect it in a bin and then I put it outside in a plant. Everything is like this. I cannot even tell you how much, uh, because for me it becomes so a way of live uh, that I need to do my part. And everybody around me, they are educated pushed uh, otherwise i get mad uh, mm-hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well and what i think is so cool is that your company you're made to order and so tell me a little yes, bit about exactly. that like whole process of making that decision because for most they might see that as well why you could make more and make more money but why made to order yeah exactly when i finish it uh, i mean we have a little hole in the story but uh, <laughs> let's go back yeah to Italy after I finished my degree, my in doctor, and I came already in America one time at 21, actually as a model, and then I decided that I want to be a couture designer. So I went uh, to a couture school. It's not like here that everybody provides a designer uh, without the school. In Italy, it's serious. You want to be a dentist, you go to get to dentist school. You want to be a teacher, you go to the school. You want to be a designer, you have to go to the school. What do they mainly teach in design school when it comes to fashion? What's kind of the leading pieces of that program? 
Yeah, the program, I mean, I already did the program of pattern making <laughs> of when I was 18, when I was in Perugia. I already did it myself. I already learned how to do it because I want it for me. At the Couture School in Rome, the Academia Coefia that I did, they actually become a sister program with FIDM here in Los Angeles. Actually, my professor is still there. First of all, they teach you the most amazing thing that I can say that he always said to me, and I always said to all my assistants and part makers, I say, each fabric has a sound. Close your eyes, rub your hands with the fabric, and even you're blind, you will be able to recognize the fabric from the sound. Wow. Wow. So... That's why when I touch a fabric, I can understand exactly the composition, closing my eyes and then putting my hands and say, oh, yeah, this is there is polyester, right, inside, or this is not pure cotton, right? Without looking anything, because when you are in a meeting with sales reps, like I, I had a fabric trade show last week, and then I had the day after a sales rep come and see me, and I was... I'm not challenging myself, uh, but I am all the time (laughs) 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 to see if I still got it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I had a question, say, is this is uh, like this and this, right? You say, yes, how you know? I said, every fabric has a voice. Wow. Yeah. What is it about fabric? So I think there are so many different types of fabrics out there. What is it specifically about fabric that makes it special? I mean, the ability to do everything with it. I mean, it's a whole world I don't think a lot of people understand. Well, no, it's pretty easy. When you decide the color and the fabric uh, that you have to make uh, an outfit, a garment, could be anything, could be a wedding dress, uh, or it can be a sweatshirt, pants, or jeans. When you decide uh, the fabric, uh, and now that teach in the couture business, dictate you what can you do with that because the fabric is going to tell you how it will fit on the body i mean even different stretch fabric has a different way that can fit you so it's lightly but you know you really have to see first the fabric it will dictate you what to do so and that is not the other way around yeah you can design anything you want it but then is a little backwards. So in fact, in couture, you create the fabric uh, to have in mind on the runway to have this flowy dress uh, or, you know, or this uh, beautiful chiffon. Uh, but you have to have uh, first the fabric and then the design. In order the design to be, you, c- you cannot realize a specific design if you don't have a specific fabric. So... And my mission was, and my professor and director of the Academia Coif in Rome, is, um, he said that I always was a special kid. And, you know, what are you doing is impossible. He said to me, mm, you are the tailor couture of the fitness wear, the active wear, how, and the yoga wear, and how you do that. I said, I do it. Because when I talk with my client, I can even recognize the height and the weight uh, from the voice. Wow. Wait, seriously? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. That's incredible. Well, it's easy. But see, when you order from me, I have to get uh, your measurements. And it's nice to actually have a phone conversation. A lot of company, they take away the phone from the website too, or they have all, but everybody runs away different. I run the old way in Italy. I just do it in the old way because to me, it's the only way that my life works. If I make a durable product and custom made for you, you're not going to get rid of that. You're going to get stuck forever. And then your daughter is going to take it. and. If you see my Google reviews in my website at the bottom of the rojani.com, you will see clients that say, oh, it's 10 years I have these pants, but I finally decide to buy another two. And I say, God, you know, you really 
took a long time to go back and say, well, your product lasts forever. And that is, in my way, little by little, one pants, one yoga at a time, one woman at a time, I create less pollution, I create less travel around. There is no returns. So, because it's made for you. I teach you in the phone how to take your measurements at the crotch in the front. I was talking yesterday with a client, she had twins and and she said, oh, my body, she said, don't worry about it. I teach you how to do it. But she said, I have a cesarean. She said, don't worry. We're just going to take the crotch from where all the seam they meet. We are flat on the table. And I go on and on and say, wow, you are incredible. This was a new client. And she said, I'm going to get more from you. I said, I want to. Obviously, I need your business because it's it's hard to get business if the product lasts so long. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I think there's something to that also in terms of custom made. And I know we've talked about this before where, you know, there's something special about having something custom made for you. You take care of it differently. You wear it differently. You wash it differently. You end up looking out for it much more intentionally then you might if you just pull something off the rack and buy it because it's made perfectly for you. Yeah, exactly. You feel that uh, you finally have satisfaction of what you really wanted because unconsciously, all of us, we want something that is not too long or too short. It's not too tight or not too loose. You know, why suffer so much? You know, I mean, life is really so complicated. Why to go and try to get in the store something that is approximately your size. It never can be, because we all have uh, different in seam. And most of the time, one leg is longer than the other ones. And I do leggings uh, that uh, the right leg, for example, is shorter than the left, because that's a normal thing to be asymmetric. And that's, I think, is uh, the quality that I offer is a mission there because the durability, the quality is also not only on the fabric and the way that is made, but also with the thread that they are from the United States. And the clothing, they last because they're sewing, they're sewing here. I wish we have the working shop uh, on Beverly Boulevard since. Uh, 20 years over there. My people, they are 20 years there with me. And I teach them everything I knew. It. I'm still teaching them, okay? <laughs> because I get updates uh, all the time. And I uh, go through the shows and this and that. Uh, and there are always a new technique, a new to look uh, and apply to my whole mission. Because I counted just for the people that uh, they appreciate. One time you try my legging, then you cannot kind of go back uh, to the other ones uh, because we wash it and then we hang dry. You don't need to use electricity. I don't want to use electricity. I tell them all the time, I just hang it, hang it. Don't waste electricity, you know. You should have seen the laundry I did yesterday all the hangers all over around near the heaters and they dry. So you have to understand that you can give it up. If you do your small mission, it's a big mission. You don't undercut yourself because some people, they say, oh, I don't count anything. And if I don't use the water, if I flash the toilet somewhere, no, put something in your toilet, like a cup of uh, jars with water so you use less you don't need that much water in the toilet you know when you brush your teeth don't let it go the water you know just close it open it when you need or pour it in a glass this is so important to create a product that is timeless it is fashion because it's timeless but it's not the fast fashion And also, whoever buys from me is very involved in environmental because they wanted a product that lasts long. And all the time they say, I'm going to throw away all the other company without mentioning it, but they do. (laughs) (laughs) They say they last 
eight washes. I work out every day. You know, I can't waste that much fabric. And where do I give it? To who do I give it? You know, I don't want to throw it in the trash, but I don't have time. So they give it all together, the drawer of uh, the they my permanent, I call them fashion. And instead, they go with my permanent products that takes the shape of your body and it lasts long. Even you lose a little bit of weight or you gain a little weight, it doesn't matter. The fabric knows what to do. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I... It's, so coming from a little bit of your psychology background too, I mean, what does that do for somebody when they have clothing that is made for them and fitted to them? I mean, and colors. I mean, what does that do for the person? Yes, exactly. That is another part of the huge mission that I wear on my shoulder like a big backpack. (laughs) (laughs) Not of money, but (laughs) of uh, good intention, my backpack. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, what I try actually every time when I created this durable product uh, is to give them uh, the opportunity to be what uh, they don't even know their potential. But I give them the opportunity of the 100% of their potential as a human being because uh, they look themselves in the mirror and say, God, I feel good. God, I feel secure. I'm going to go and work and drive and not aggressively today because I'm happy. So I'm going to let the other people go. And I'm not pushing my pedal or brake so much. And I'm going to go in my office and love everybody because I love myself. I feel good. So I want everybody to feel good. So there is a lot of effect that will give you a special color for you and a special fit. Uh, and they will give you a door of uh, kindness, uh, I say. Open the door of the kindness. Uh, and that, if you love yourself, uh, it's the first step to love the planet. You cannot, like Jay Shetty says, you know, that I follow, the Jay Shetty's yeah. genius. Oh, he's a great person. His content's amazing. I listen every day. Mm-hmm. His and book's fantastic him. too. I met him. I really? Met him. Oh my gosh, oh my that's God. fantastic. What was that like? I met him. I was waiting in office. I was actually almost leaving and he came in, but I never see him in person. And then he started talking. And I said, oh no, he's Jay Shetty. I said, I wish I can do a pants for Jay Shetty costume, but it's hard to get to him. And he will love uh, for him and his wife uh, to have my energy as an Italian couture designer that decided to be here in California to give a little piece of humanity in the way that we act with people still in a fun reaction. And so I told him, I said, I'm very shy in these things. I hate to stop for celebrity. I never do. Even I work with so many. He was almost leaving, and I said, Jay, I'm sorry. I have to say hi and thank you. <laughs> thank you for your talent. And so, and we talked for a minute, but it was just amazing experience. He's in my speakerphone. You know, I have a, a shower speakerphone that when you put the Calm application. Yeah, yeah. And then I put it in the shower, the speakerphone. And then I hear Jay Shetty. So that's the best way to start your day with a calm application. Because if you calm and relax, uh, then you can give it to everybody a little piece of mind, you know, like relaxation too. So it doesn't matter what they say. Oh, well, we cannot ship it today. That's okay. We will find a way. Let me talk with the person. I will arrange. So if you are in control, then everybody around you feel that you can give her the peace of mind, even they don't do just sharing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not all Buddhist monks, but we can all aspire to be. Well, I mean, it's a big example. And I really like the interview with Tanya Ali because uh, in her website, uh, there is, a, I don't know if you had a chance, uh, I was exploring 
there is a, a section that recycle and resell. And I was uh, clicking the links uh, and I totally love the link uh, about uh, the donate uh, your textile. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Yes. It's uh, the America Recycles. Yeah. And you can get, um, and I was thinking, I said, well, that's what I should do. I should, uh, you know, kind of uh, start this program. I donate scraps and textile to everybody. I know that they're doing something with those scraps. Uh, the assistant of my manager she does in her free time dolls uh, clothing uh, for children in the hospital mm -hmm. so and i'm so proud that we can give her all the scraps uh, for those dolls and like again you know you do what you can in your small way you give uh, what you are you open your shield here we go come in i'm not afraid hit me, it will pass through me. And it starts with wearing items of clothing that are made for you to give that, that confidence. Made for you, my mission as a designer was uh, to create a product that is so special because it will make you special because it's going to be a part of yourself uh, that is going to give you the opportunity to uh, achieve uh, a better level of happiness and love and success, actually, because it will, when you have this tool in your hand, you will be more successful. Yeah. I think. One of the topics I also wanted to dive into in relation to that is color. So for me, I mean, color in the creative world and filmmaking and stuff like that, you can, color is emotion. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. In one point, I was a fashion editor of a magazine called View, and I was writing, beside creating and producing the stories and booking models and photographers and all beautiful things, and that I also, I was writing the fashion horoscope. And, <laughs> and the fashion horoscope is, first of all, you know, each sign has also their colors, you know. And so I was always directing this uh, horoscope in a more funny way, because you got to be funny to be relaxed, uh, give something to somebody. The humor is so important, you know. And like for Aries, like me, we are on fire all the time. So my color is red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when we are red, I feel that I can win uh, the world, you know. I go out with red and... I'm so powerful. Color is power. You know, each one of us uh, can relate it. And the Virgo, for example, they have their own power with uh, neutral colors. Or, or they like uniforms. They like all this army and khaki. And then they will wear army and khaki all the time. That all, I used to work as a stylist too and producer for this uh, photographer, Philip Dixon. And he always want to wear khaki because it was a vir Virgo. And they say, yes, I just want a uniform. And then we make the same kind of coat, linen coat for Rod Stewart uh, for this album cover. So it, it's Wait, just, was uh, it the blue one? No, it was a natural. Yeah. Natural, natural color. Because uh, with Philip and other celebrities, you know, we're trying to promote uh, the no dye colors you know because less you process uh, the fabric and more healthy is for your body to less poison let's say like i don't want to get to some um, dying too complicated but i enjoy also to be a stylist and a image maker like for example with isabella rossellini i was the imagine maker at lancome i was working back and forth from new york uh, and isabella and i we got really get along very well we were speaking in english very similar accent because my accent is a little bit roman and she has the same you know kind of and with isabella i create for her beautiful dresses uh, for the lancome campaign all based uh, on the idea of the classical timeless uh, elegance uh, international because the campaign of Isabella was the ultimate international look 
that you can do. It can be in Paris, of course, uh, publicist and agency from Hong Kong, and you can be in Japan, but everybody will see Isabella the International icon. And when you work with big photographers like this, like with Hero that he was shooting, uh, or I work with her Brits, uh, Greg Gormon, Matthew Rosten, that we met in Paris outside the fashion show, Thierry Mugler, when we are kids. And you have a, a specific taste of uh, the international. And that's what I think my clothes are too, international taste. They have this classic lines that they are fashion, but it's a fashion over the elite. The elite buy that because there is nothing more beautiful than simplicity. Simplicity for me has been my goal to less is best, obviously, you know. And when I had assistant designers, they were putting so many things. I said, no, take one. That's what in Couture they told me. Take one. Last the fabric speak themselves. You don't have to overpower the fabric. If you overpower the fabric, then you break the balance. So if you balance the fabric with the right person or the right moment of the right life and the color, then you actually create the perfect couture fit at leisure. And it's just, I don't know if there is enough time to talk and this time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can dive in. What I find fascinating about just really the idea of timeless and in international fashion is that, yeah, every country does have fashion to a different extent. And how do you connect with all those different cultures while at the same time being as conscious as possible? And to me, that is what you do is creating timeless pieces. I think that staying, quote unquote, on trend has become so popular, but you know, in five, six years, that thing will move on, or even in some circles, it's one year. And so the idea of stripping everything away and letting the fabric speak for itself, I think that is such a timeless consideration. And more so what I want to dive into you with was natural dyes, because I think the colors are important, but when you're actually naturally dyeing something, it is a healthier fabric. You let the fabric speak a little bit more and you have a better product at the end of the day. Yes, actually, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I want to say that let the fabric talk and give you the shape. It's like a sensitivity and respect. You have to respect the fabric. When you respect the fabric, then you assign the color of the fabric to the right person. We have tencel, for example, made from trees. We introduced bikini from the recycled bottle. 87%, which is a lot. It took me forever to find the right supplies because you got to go in the water with a recycled bikini that is tremendously beautiful. And I highly encourage everybody to look what we do. And I think that the colors, if you try to find company, they offer you great colors, but they guarantee that the color process is based uh, on the yarn, not uh, after they weave back and forth. So if they can, I encourage every designer to ask uh, to their supplies, hey, when and which point uh, this fabric is being dyed, you know, because if it start from the beginning, then there is less waste of water. That's the only thing I said. So why is that? I mean, just from my standpoint, just not knowing that process, what makes it less wasteful to do it at the very beginning of yarn versus later? What's the process difference when that happens? Well, because every fabric, for example, I mean, I was a textile design too in Italy and I designed for some company when actually on the circular machine that they're only available in Germany at that time. And you had to do with the uh, cross, the colors, the jacquards, uh, which now you do everything in a computer. So a yarn, for example, is seven threads, right? Your T-shirt, for example, is made of, uh, let's say, to keep a simple seven threads. To get to, to become uh, a fabric, you have to twist those seven threads together of the yarn 
and then run it through the machine and become a fabric. So that's when you choose the composition. That's what the textile design does. They say, okay, one thread is going to be stretch because it's more comfortable. Even the sustainable fabric is better if they have one, a little bit of stretch because we learn that it's more comfortable. And then we're going to have uh, four of these threads uh, cotton, okay? There is two left. What are we going to do with these two? Well, let's put some poly, okay? Okay, we do two poly because the cotton shrinks a lot. So we want to stop the shrinking and give it the flexibility. I'm giving you like a simple example right now. So, but as a textile designer, you can sit down on the table and make experiment, okay, here, there, there. You change the lycra, you change the stretch. You put two lycra and three cotton and two acrylic, then it becomes an all different feeling. So it depends if you do poly, acrylic, rayon, what is the compositions, you know, that what do you want the final but beside all of this conversation that is very couture, each uh, thread, uh, if you dye the color in, in the gray, because uh, each yarn becomes, when it's natural, is color, natural color. So there is no dye on that. And even white is dyed white. So you don't wear, oh, say I wear natural because I wear white. That's not true, you know? The worst color with the worst pollution is blue because it's one of the difficult ones to dye. And in fact, when you wear a jeans that is very blue, our professor shows us in the microscope what it does in our body. The color when it's on your body, it comes out in scales, like little scales. And the blue scales, they get all over in your skin and they get stuck under your jeans wow and is that a quality of denim or the dyeing of the denim because i wondered about that is the process it depends when it was dyed and how intense the blue was got it so the more stronger the blue is the more scales there are on your body less uh, dye is light uh, there is less blue dye I mean, we can talk about this forever, but yeah. I have so much knowledge. But let's go back on the weaving. So if I say I want uh, a gray T-shirt and four threads in cotton, one in lycra and two in poly, for example, I give the opportunity to dry faster because there is a poly. I give, I give the opportunity to have a little comfort because there is one spandex uh, and I give the natural feeling. Uh, Overall, because there is four in cotton. I don't know if it's boring, this conversation. No, this is, this is fascinating because I think, you know, the impression around apparel and clothing, I think, is centered around, well, recycled materials are the way to go, but not knowing that, hey, there's seven threads in there. You know, does 100% cotton hold up as long as something with a little bit of poly, even if it's recycled poly? You know, I think that that process is very important to kind of shed light on because, you know, I think there's a balance between, and maybe you could answer this better than I can. Is it on the consumer, the textile company, or the clothing company to kind of demand either one, a better process, or B, better colors, or C, just better materials in general? It's all about the money. Mm. Okay, because cotton costs more than acrylic or poly. So it depends what you want. So you want to make money or you want to make it durable? and healthy products. It comes from all about the money. Do you want to protect your people or you care less, you just want the money? So, and going back on the dyeing, when you dye in the thread uh, one by one, before to twist them and become one thread, right? This is the many thread that they make uh, one uh, thread. I don't know in English, but for example, seven component, of one thread. So, and before to weave them all together, because you have to take those threads, the compound one of the final thread, the fiber, and you put it in this machine, you have to dye them because they're all color natural. 
if you don't dye them before they weave and they make one thread, then you stuck with one thread with the component of seven that still have to dye. It is cheaper to dye them all together when after they weaved it. It is cheaper because you don't have to go through seven, the seven process. Mm -hmm. Not seven, sorry, three, because the cotton, okay? So it is cheaper, but it's healthier for you if the manufacturer dies before to twist the yarn because they wash it, they took away the scales of the colors that get stuck in your skin. Any color has their scales. And then uh, after it's weaved, uh, this weave that goes back to another washing and take away the extra, right, before to become a fabric. So that's why any of my clothing lasts longer, because the fabric doesn't lose the color. And why does it not lose the color? Because this process is done in the beginning. And so uh, there's a good chance if it's done in the beginning, unless you leave it in the sun for 10 days uh, on the hanger, then you get sun mark, uh, then it will never change the color. Because absorb so well and get washed, absorb, get washed, and then threads, then weave it together and then wash again. So it's already washed two times before it become a fabric. So, I mean, it's complicated, but the reality is you waste less water when you wash it in the beginning because there is, it's weaker and takes less water to take away the wash the color, more healthy for you. So you got to ask everybody all the time when you order fabric, when do you guys die? In which stage you die this? So how can... I mean, this is game changing just for me to learn this information. I mean, what can a consumer do to kind of be more informed on that side? I mean, because okay, it kind of comes from the company uh, side, right? To kind of say, hey, no, we dye it early. Make sure that when you go buy a t-shirt, you say, is this garment dye? Do you know what is I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because it means that the company care less about you, okay? And what they did, a lot of successful company that I don't want to mention, what they do, they weave, they prepare the, the, the fabric, they cut the t-shirt. Every single t-shirt is made in natural color because there is no dye. It's only money. So, and when they need uh, in black, uh, they dye it in black. When they need it in red, they dye the t-shirt in red. So what do you think the... I mean, is it a consumer mindset shift of, you know, hey, I need to be more conscious about, one, what I'm buying, but is it more fashion in general? No, I just say the people, they don't go through all of this and because it's more technical for a designer to be asking this. And it's more of the honor of the company because, you know, designer, they are environmental oriented. They will say, can I buy this fabric and I can, that is, uh, the thread is washed before to make the garment. And it costs more, probably, most of the, all the time. It costs less to just cut ready to dye, it's called the fabric. And the ready to dye brings you a lot of problem of health, I think. Because each color can give you a different type of cancer or whatever. I'm still studying which color does what. Wow. Well, and from a fashion perspective also, I mean, I obviously handmade, made to order, premium fabrics, dyed early, all of those will cost more money regardless. However, if you're keeping it for 20, 30 years, will it cost more? If you had to buy seven of the same thing that wasn't made as well, is it going to cost more in the long term? And that's always the conversation I usually get into. I have with other people's you know, think about the longevity of something, not necessarily the instant this works for right now. Yeah, exactly. The longevity is built in uh, the fabric. You cannot, I don't think uh, a garment dye, for example, it will last that long uh, because the process has to be so strong uh, in order to dye those fabric everywhere, also inside, in between uh, the weaving, that have to go through, so, and that it will not last. There is a lot of cheating that, unfortunately, is a, in purpose, 
they put some fabric inside some when they weave it they're not strong enough so the pants uh, they will destroy as soon as possible so they can go and buy more i'm against uh, that money situation because i promote uh, and durability and also I promote this couture fitness uh, because when I make a product for you you don't need to return it so we don't have uh, the gas back and forth UPS USPS uh, plastic here and there no no there isn't and I don't get returned and once a month maybe they say Oh, you know what? Can you do an alteration for the uh, Lent uh, because I don't want to wear it with the high heels anymore, so I'm going to send it back. Uh, they pay to send it back. I don't charge her for the alteration, but they pay both ways. Oh, I convince her, why don't you give it to your daughter? So we save. Like last month, um, this woman ordered a pair of shorts, and she said, I don't want the black anymore. I said, why don't you keep it? And I say, oh, yes, you know what? I can give it to my sister. I said, yeah, it's perfect. So we save. Um, the waste you know, cycle. Back and oh, back and forth, back and forth. It's, it's rather prefer to donate the product than have a waste of back and forth, you know? What do you believe is, and I know it might be different for each person, but what is your favorite fabric on earth? My favorite fabric is this to wear or to help uh, the sensibility. Could be both. I'm curious, on somebody who understands fabric at such a, such a deep level, what do you believe is the best fabric? To me, I mean, I'm an old uh, school. I like 100% cotton because I do like the tensile a lot uh, because uh, for what it does. Uh, I do like the vegan stretch suede. I test all the fabric, so I text them. And the vegan stretch suede that I have is polyspandex. But I have this bomber in that brown that I put it in my custom-made section that is me with the picture. Yeah, you know, <laughs> custom-made. <laughs> it's six years I make that sample, and I cannot tell you how many times I throw it in a washer like this and hang it. Nothing happened, no discoloring, and you feel like it could be a real leather, but it's not. It's a big and suede. I have that. Uh, I brought it with me everywhere, and everywhere in the world, they say, whoa, they have to touch it to see that it's vegan. They say, this is not suede. I say, yeah, I know. It's same color and same that this other famous Italian designer without saying the name, did, uh, but this is vegan. It's not real leather, you know, it's just, uh, I remember I used to work with Linda Blair, you know, from oh, Pamela Anderson, and all of them, they were very against the fur and everything else, uh, so we always tried to find already that time something more natural for them, because they just... Uh, part of the movement uh, that a lot of celebrity they have a power to help and if more celebrity they will get the board with this uh, you know then people do, i mean it's a trend a lot of people they think is a trend so they do sustainable clothes just because it's a trend it's not a mission and that's why i'm a rebellious because i feel that i cannot be associate with that kind of crowd i am doing my little business one pence of a time one woman at a time every day to help and that's a very simple little mission <laughs> well and what about that idea that you kind of can wear into the clothing meaning the clothing starts to kind of take the shape of the person Oh, yeah, yeah, because the clothing is flat. Mm -hmm. It comes from a roll, right? Mm -hmm. You cut it, and then uh, it's flat. It's still flat after you actually sew it, and it becomes uh, three-dimensional only if you put a three-dimensional something inside. It could be a mannequin. It could be a barrel of wine. <laughs> but the clothing they will feel 
they are more alive than what you think, you know. The clothing, they do have a soul and a happiness. Sometimes uh, in my Instagram, when I see a client that we all become friends, uh, that she swim uh, or she paddleboard uh, with um, my shorts uh, and the bra, they say, oh, you brought the Rajani in the beach. Or they're going to be so happy, those shorts. Those shorts are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to last forever. They don't want to leave you, you know. So they are a happy clothing when they have different experience. One time they leave the table, then they know they have a mission. They're going to have to make feel good to whoever bought it. And it's a very big experience. Uh, for them uh, to become part of their body. Because with you don't have to sweat uh, really in a pair of leggings to get your shape. It's enough you keep it two hours and you sit down. That's why I tell the client, don't worry, it will take your shape. Now it's flat. And soon that feels, uh, you know, the natural heat that we have, then it will take your bump and perfection and whatever else. Uh, I will make a second skin. Mm -hmm. After all the things that you've experienced going from, I mean, Italy being rebellious and going to school early and doing all the things you've done, what's kind of your favorite part of the process? Is it the finished garment? Is it the person wearing it? Is it the fabric research? What is your favorite part? Oh, actually, it's been my favorite part uh, when we used to sell to Equinox. uh, and we used to have this hand tag and Equinox by Rojani. And the most, I think, uh, that fill up my heart is when I see somebody I don't know that wear a generic pants that I did not cost to make. But somewhere in the street, uh, when Equinox sold a lot of my pants and products, so often I will see somebody in the street uh, with my pants that I can recognize it from anywhere because it's polish is just hangs the body in a different way and you see my tag in the back and I remember a client I was saying to me and they said with your pants I don't have to go to the gym that's the problem I look fit even if I'm not <laughs> <laughs> this is with the suplex and then another client with another lighter fabric we have is a Oh, Elizabeth, I have to tell you something funny. Today I went out, I was walking out the door, and then I felt that I didn't have anything on. I looked down, and yes, I was wearing your pants. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, these kind of funny stories every day because I talk with people, and they're real funny. Like yesterday, I was talking with somebody that was a first-time client again, and she ordered chocolate. And I asked her, I said, how did you find me? Mm, because you're new. And she said, well, I, found, I did the Google search for yoga chocolate pants. You came out on the Google uh, image, but there were a lot of them. And I said, so why did you pick me? And she said, well, from the picture, I saw the quality. I had to sit down because that was a great compliment. I called my co-worker, Sarah, and I said, Sarah, you will not believe it. We came out in a search of this, and this new client, uh, she actually picked us for the quality that she's seen a small picture of the Google images. <laughs> it's a testament to what you've always committed your life to. Yesterday, just yesterday, she gave me this happiness. I was really, really happy. And yesterday, I was really happy too, because... This client um, that needs this model, I talked with her yesterday that we did the cover in 2018 because I have over 450 covers. They call me the cover designer in my little circle. Nobody else had for over 450 covers. And the model, she said, we're ready to do another cover. I said, you know what? It could be fun to remake the same outfit. She said, I don't have to remake it. I have it. Eight years ago, it's like new. Okay, I said, then uh, we can take the cover of eight years ago and shoot another cover. You're wearing the same outfit with the cover. That could be a nice cover of a cover. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
A hundred percent. And it also shows that, you know, I think a lot of people see celebrity lifestyle as, you know, the next latest and greatest. You buy the next thing. You're always, you know, they're the people on the cover. But the fact that the person on the cover eight years is wearing the same thing. It's a great story. Oh, my God. I told her, I said, we can shoot uh, because she's coming in Los Angeles to shoot. And I said, we can shoot that as a cover option, but I already have in mind uh, what it will work for you. And then last night, uh, I sent her the pictures of what I think it will. I said, this time I want you to wear red. I feel red for you. And I sent her some red and black option also for her trainer because she opened a gym. And I said, I can do the uniform of your trainers uh, matching the gym and we can do the co-branding to push your brand. That's what I do. For small business, uh, it's very important to be supported from small business like me. They're all small business supporting small business. And so I would say, I will help you to promote your brand. Just tell me more about your gym. You know, who goes there? What's the colors? So at the end, I told her, I said, well, let's promote this color in red and black, the color of your gym, and have your trainer wear black and red with the red stripe in the side, with the pocket, and then with this Alandra bra for you in red with the black strap, for them black with the red strap. So opposite. And she said, oh, yeah, I like the idea, I like the idea. I said, yeah, but we should keep available this uh, look also for your client and to say yes that's what we should do so eight years later she owns a gym she was just a fitness model she went long way i said i'm so proud of you you know because she went such a long way and she said with your help your clothing they are amazing i said you don't have to tell me this now because i cannot record this this is bugs me write it in the google review Put your pictures of your of my outfit. If I could record all this beautiful compliment. Yesterday was a great day. You asked me what the satisfaction. Yes, yesterday, two big satisfaction. This new client with the chocolate image that's, that scream couture from Google. Little images in the middle of all the other ones. If I could record that, you know and play it now and if i could record what this mother told me after eight years you know she said to me i will never ever wear anything else beside your clothing because she ordered this outfit but she has other things you know just regular things because your quality is impeccable makes my body looks uh, perfect it just is nothing in the world that compare to what you offer and i want to offer the same to my client that they say okay yes so are you going to do a transformation and she start talking because i work with transformation groups that they take women before and then they teach them how to become you know lose their weight to become more toned more healthy with different food, a different lifestyle, introduce the walking and all of that. And a community kind of a tight group of transformation. And I work with uh, different transformation groups. Uh, like last week, one from Florida came and see me, Claudia from Posh. Uh, and they only carry my clothing at their gym. They say, we don't want to carry anybody else. You know, you make my gym looks great because everybody's wearing that color combination that they have uh, and the purples and peaches uh, and different type of purples and uh, black uh, and gray. So everybody feels like a team is a union. When we work out, uh, we have a team kind of mm, feeling because we all are united. It's like a military. Why the military, they wear everybody, you know, because there is a group feeling of united. And that goes back to the color that you asked me before. The color does give you united kind of feeling in important in your group. Why the military, they have all one color, camouflage or gray or blue or whatever. Community. 
community. The color, it is also a choice for the community. But the color is also a stand-up because when you work solo or you are the captain, you have a different uh, things going on, you know? So, <laughs> and you are the leader, you are the chief, and you have to show your power. Otherwise, you know, you have to use the color to embellish your life uh, and to be part of uh, what your mission is. Color is mission, put it in this mm-hmm. way. <laughs> color is mission. Color is mission. <laughs> oh, my God. We can talk about this forever. I mean, yeah, forever. and I had one last question for you. In that, oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. And that in Italy, I'm guessing it's going to be Italy, but where is your favorite place on earth to enjoy nature? In Italy, my favorite place there are the lakes. Like there is this lago near my hometown. It's called Lago di Piediluco. I always want to go to see the Lago di Piedi Luco when I'm in Italy because it's the most pretty landscape for me. There is a little island pointed in the middle and all these little houses around uh, half of the is with little houses with little trattorias. You can really, you know, enjoy the fresh bread and homemade pasta over there. And the lake... uh, you know, I'm a theosophist too. So the lake, they have the parallel wave that stop on the other side and come back. So it's a circular wave. The ocean is parallel, but it's far away. So you don't see, you cannot foresee the future. You know, it's on the other side. So in front of the ocean, there is more anxiety because you don't know where the wave is going to go. But in the lake, uh, the wave comes back because it hit one side and come back and you can almost see it if you are in the middle. So, <laughs> And that gives you peace and security. I mean, I grew up next to the ocean and I do find the ocean absolutely beautiful, probably one of my favorite things. But you're right in the fact that it almost is anxiety inducing in the sense of the scale of it. You know, you look at the horizon and it's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. But on a lake, you can actually see that rhythm almost that nature brings to you. It comes back. So you almost say, okay, so I'm here meditating or something or reading a book. uh, And by the time I am uh, on uh, page 20, that wave uh, that I just watched, I couldn't number it because you can't number the wave. But imagine the distance, and then comes back to me at page 20. So I'm just like, I hear too much of Jay Sherry, I think. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, how can people kind of look you up, get involved, order clothing from you, have a conversation with you? How can kind of people get connected with you? Oh, yeah, it's very, very easy. To make it easy, the website is my last name. (laughs) Elisabetta, Elisabetta Rujani, Rujani, R-O-G-I-A-N-I dot com. And there is a phone number at the bottom. That's the office. But most of the time when nobody else answers the phone, they connect it with my cellular and they leave a message. I will be calling back. Yeah. Wow. Well, Elisabetta, thank you so much just for taking all the time to talk about fabrics and your history and fashion and design and psychology and color. I mean, really, really just, I think there's so much value here in looking at fashion from a different light in a different way. And I think the way that you've always done it is kind of the way it should be done. And I just think you're a pioneer in that area, but also I think you're just going to keep doing amazing things. I need supporters. I need big people, other people that recognize this and say, okay, well, I need her to teach this to my people, you know, because I can go in in every single company and help them uh, to uh, all the designers. Say, okay, well, let's choose this instead of this. Or they show me the collection and I say, well, let's cut down this and make it more simple so it will be recognized. Also, it's very important to have a specific look uh, that it will be recognized. Like, it doesn't matter, like Isabella Rossellini would say, if you design this today, 
or in 10 years. It should not have a date. You are important in the fashion industry, she would say, if only you create a product that has a specific shape that people, they can recognize it. So my razor doll, a V shape uh, bra and top uh, has a, such a specific shape. Uh, it was good 25 years ago when I designed it and it's the best seller still today. And that's a proven of, I think, a spectacular simplicity vision that is not easy to be simple. I think when my teacher in Italy, the couture, they were telling me, you have to listen the fabric. I'm just doing a summarize of this, of what we said, that you have to listen the fabric, the voice, the voice has to be interpreted, and then the shape has to be timeless, uh, the quality, the threads, uh, the fitting, uh, one of a kind, uh, you have to listen the clients uh, here. That is couture. To apply couture in the yoga industry, I think is unusual, but I'm doing it because a lot of people, a lot of women, they need yoga leggings that last and they fit. Oh, just my last example, for example, if you are 40 hips, that is kind of common, but you are 28 waist, what would you go and buy? It's a very good question. Very good question, right? So... You should buy the small because you are 27, 28 waist. But if you buy the small, the fabric, any fabric it will stretch so much on your back that it will become transparent. And your husband is going to complain and say, what are you going out with this at the yoga? As soon as you bend over, you see everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what do you do? You buy a large that fit your around the hips, but it's loose on your waist because when you bend over the don, the pants are not transparent, but they lose your waist and you feel all oh, like with this extra fabric and gap and look ugly. No, with the cost to make, you do the 40 hips. That's what we are specialized. You give me your hips and then you give me your waist and I do a mix size and I just make this waist smaller, build it in a bigger pants. And same for the bras. If I work with some women, for example, post-cancer operation, disectomy, so we build the bras for the post-cancer girls, women. I build pants for women in a wheelchair after accident that the legs, they become so small, they become extra small, but unfortunately the body become a little bigger and you have to make it with the tummy and everything that sits there and they cannot wear an extra small, otherwise they're gonna suffocate. So they don't want a large on the legs, otherwise they look more skinny than what they are. So you have to balance and give them a mixed product size so they're gonna be happy. How more happy you can be that you are in a wheelchair with the right pair of pants. That's happiness for me, for my team, to make happy our client that is on the wheelchair. How satisfaction is that? And that is why I think a whole community has to band up around you because honestly, you are on a mission. You won't be stopped and you're going to make the world a better place because you already have. We do what we can every day, following the instruction of what it will make you a better human being too, with my clothing and a better planet uh, with our techniques uh, that uh, you don't dispose our clothes. You keep them. Read the Google interview at the bottom of my website and you're going to start laughing forever. They're gonna, and you're going to think, how oh, this woman can stay in business if the customer they buy every 10 years depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do I stay in business if you buy a product every 10 years? <laughs> I need new clients. That's what it is. Exactly. I they will say, you need more clients. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Elizabeth, thank you so much, really, for everything. It's been a pleasure. And I can't wait to see how many people are around wearing 
your clothing and feeling so much better about it too. We are here to help. That's the only thing I can do. Amazing. Thank you for listening to the Sustainable Goat Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Kassenham. With each episode, we can further define what it means to create a truly sustainable and resilient future. I think the new status is to show that, that you actually care. You want to drive change and you want to be part of a sustainable future. People fight for what they love. Let's really hold tight for a small but significant shift in the way we live, we consume, and we plan our life. Join us at sustainablegoat.com.